So thank you. Uh, I know it's the last presentation, so <laughs> please bear with me. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about embodied musical interaction, uh, more specifically a biosignal control metaphor for, for interactive musical systems. So just a brief introduction, I am uh, Luis Ali, I am a PhD student at the University of Porto in the doctoral program in digital media. And uh, we are researching on uh, biosignal uh, or on designing interactive musical systems that are by, uh, driven by biosignals. So in particular, uh, we are working in specifics with theater, with actors. So we are asking the question, how can we foster the, the expressiveness of uh, performance, of a, like enhancing the presence, for example, of an actor in stage uh, using biosignals and uh, using that to uh, control all the generation, the sound generation, musical gen uh, generation. So mainly, very broadly, this is my research topic. And inside of that, we are going to talk a little bit about this uh, embodied musical interaction. So first of all, uh, we are going to speak and we talk a little bit about some theories and models and some techniques on embodied musical interaction. So the first question is, what is embodied musical interaction? Uh, since the beginning of the ancient music, uh, musical practices and instruments, over time musical instruments have been designed to facilitate embodied experience, like for example, hand movements on a guitar. Okay, the guitar is designed around the, the expressiveness of a hand. Uh, with the advent of electronic music, so giving a big jump to the 20th century, uh, embodied music interaction became an important research area focusing on how technology can enhance musical experience. This resulted in the creation of new musical instruments that incorporate body movements. The first was probably, I don't know if you know the theremin, that uh, instrument that you play without touching the instrument. Uh, then we have, for example, more DJ-oriented things like Chaos Path from Korg, and even the we uh, the Wii remote uh, controller for the Nintendo. Okay, so all of these have been also used and looked upon to, to control uh, electronic music. More recently, advances in computer science and engineering have enabled the development of new te technologies, mainly wearable devices, virtual reality can enhance embodied musical inter interaction. The continuous development of musical instruments and technologies uh, and the growing interest in relationship between the musical interaction and the body. Uh, and even the mind and the environment it's, uh, can be brought to the equation when we are creating music with these new technologies, mainly computer-based technologies. So... <laughs> Here in a very rough way, we can have a quick survey about the main models and theories about uh, embodied musical interaction. Uh, we can look at it in this, with a sensory motor theory that proposed that musical interaction integrates sensory input, motor output and cognitive processes. It suggests that body movements and sensory experience shape our musical perception and also the expression. Uh, for the purpose of our workshop, probably we will work around this, uh, this theme about the sensory motor theory, but we also have the cognitive models that focus on mind processes in in the, and uh, interpret uh, musical information. These models consider all musical exp is experienced by attention, for example, memory, and also perception. Uh, cultural models emphasize the role of cultural and social factors in shaping musical experience, for example, how musical practices, beliefs, and traditions influence musical perception and uh, expression, and embodied music cognition that explores the relationship between musical experience and the body. Uh, so here are the four main uh, models and theories for embodied musical interaction. We uh, focus mainly on the sensory motor theory. So in the top of that, we can consider that in our working definition of embodied musical interaction is the dynamical ex relationship between musical expression and the bother sensory motor abilities. 
There are already some technologies, uh, some we've already been discussing here. Uh, for example, the motion capture is a technology for recording and analyzing body movements. Okay, that can be used uh, to create a musical instrument or interface that respond better to the um, performer's movements or even to, to study the connection between musical expression and movement. Because, uh, for example, when playing piano, there are some schools that approach that also the body posture influences a lot what you are playing on a piano. So this is uh, motion capture is a very... Uh, good technique to study this kind of questions. Uh, another type of technology that we can use in embodied musical uh, interaction is virtual and augmented reality that consists on, on creating virtual or augmented env environments where uh, the users can explore immersive musical experiences. Uh, I didn't catch uh, the, the, the example, but there are some examples where, for example, you have the recreation of a context of a st uh, recording studio where you put your glasses and you can then navigate on that studio, operate some uh, equipments and make some uh, uh, sound adjustments in virtual reality. So this is another way to to bring uh, embodied, embodied interaction to 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 hear. Another way is multimodal interface that involve combining different forms of inputs such as gestures, voice, touch, uh, to create new forms of musical interaction. For example, nowadays the famous, I put some text and I can have some music like the Google uh, experiments that are doing now with machine learning where you put some textual description and it generates some musical content according to that musical description. So that is a very new new thing to work with textual, but we can use uh, gestures like the Wii controller, for example, voice uh, to activate or uh, deactivate some sounds, for example, touch, for example, touching displays where we use to explore new forms of musical expression. There are some uh, applications that are developed uh, for, for example, touching displays, where you only in touching displays it works. Um, so these multimodal interfaces are also explored to create embodied uh, in, uh, musical interactions. Inside of this, there is the gesture recognition that is in, inside a little bit of motion capture, but some more fine tuned uh, that interpret body movements to control music parameters. Um, this is interesting because you can have uh, like uh, hand movements that are control uh, that control specific sounds, for example. And this is not so much computer motion capture is is more computer vision. Okay, and uh, there are some algorithms, for example, in dance, the there uh, there are some algorithms of computer vision that are looking at the stage, looking at the dancers. Okay, and according to the rhythm and speed and the velocity of those dancers, for example, you can have changes on rhythm, on harmony, or on melody of the sound that you are hearing. So this kind of recognition is also interesting. Uh, more recently, wearable technology that involves incorporating sensors in uh, small devices like uh, small watches, like uh, phones, uh, even rings, and even in clothes. Okay, smart textiles nowadays are also a very hot hot topic. Uh, like uh, Professor Gilberto has talked about that uh, uh, model that was working also with the fashion tech, and uh, there is now a, um, an idea of incorporating not only for uh, um, let's say for uh, the, the the spectacular of the thing, but also for reasons of accessibility for example okay uh, i was yesterday in the lab here in technical where they are developing some kind of sensing but uh, with in in a uh, uh, car wheel okay car wheel where you can sense for example different uh, biosignals from the driver okay also gaze gaze and combined with uh, these type of sensors also 
and the, they are also wearing some rings. So very wearable and miniature. So basically, it's miniaturization of technology uh, fosters this kind of uh, less invasive uh, sensors that can be used then to uh, control some kind of uh, musical or sound output. So this gives you gives us just a quick, very rough survey about some technologies that we can use for uh, creating prototypes that uh, involve embodied music interaction. Uh, more specific, specifically, we are going to talk about uh, biosignal approach. So using biosignals to create uh, sound, to create music, to control sound, control music, okay? <clears throat> So we can say that uh, bodies, biosignals uh, are biophysical because living cells, tissues, organs are composed in the, and organized by arrangements of molecules. We can say that uh, body signals are biochemical okay, because living cells, tissues, and organs produce and react to chemical compounds, okay, for example, neurotransmitters. We can also say that body signals are biomechanical because the living cells, tissues, and organs produce and are subjected to forces of displacement, okay? like, for example, respiratory cycles. All bio body signals are bioelectrical because living cells, tissues, and organs produce electrical and or electromagnetic fields, like, for, for example, action potentials of cellulars in the muscles when we spy, when we... We control a, a muscle, we send, a, we have a spike on an action potential on that muscle that activates the specific muscle. So uh, what we, we focus on our research is basically looking at the, the body in this kind of an electricity, an electricity generator, okay? So this is how we look at um, and how we are working with biosignals. So the biosignals that we are using are biosignals that are bioelectrical, okay? We can use also biochemical and the others that I, I talked about, but uh, bioelectrical is the ones that we are uh, more interested because they are the easiest one to tap, <laughs> simple as that, okay? Because at the end, there is some technology now available and they'll, some uh, works and background made uh, to look at the biosignals. And uh, so we use these to, to our work. Biosignals came from, came from the nervous, the musculoskeletal, circulatory, respiratory, and also from the skin, okay? Because these are mainly where we can uh, grab some uh, signals of interest, let's say like this. So biosignals, we can look at them like in this, uh, in this uh, diagram. I have here the, the there are more biosignals. These are the biosignals that we are specifically working on. Okay, For example, we are talking today about uh, high, uh, um, high gaze. We have electrocologram that we are not using here. We are not using EEGs. That's the ones that read the electrical uh, flow in the upper scalp of the bell of our brain. Uh, so we are looking only at this, but so just to tell you that there are more bio, uh, bio signals than these. These are we are we are going to um, to focus. So we have muscle um, muscle activity. That's the EMG electromyography that measures basically the movement of the um, of the muscles we have the acg that's electrocardiography that measures the, uh, the the movement of the heart of the muscle of the heart heart rate heart rate variability we have the uh, eva that's uh, electrodermal activity that measures the electrical activity of our uh, skin okay also known as gs our galvanic skin uh, response. Thank you very much. <laughs> and that's we use in some, but nowadays it's more used the term EDA than GSR. Uh, also, we have the respiration um, that is a uh, PZT because, okay, this is another one because sometimes it appears RESP, sometimes it appears uh, PZT because PZT is more related to the type of the sensor that is a, a flex. 
but we have respiration. Also, we have the brain, okay, with EEG, electroencephalography, okay. So just to give you a little more, a little bit more detail, to give you more detail about these signals, here we have some um, description of what happens when we move a muscle, okay. We have uh, the order for the brain. The brain sends an order to move the specific muscle. That muscle receives uh, an action potential that is translated into electricity in an action potential. We detect that with the sensor. We can detect that spike of energy. Okay. So one of the things that is important to understand about this type of sensors is that they only catch spikes of energy. They are not catching the force of the muscle. Okay, for that we use another type of sensors on muscles that is mechano, uh, mechanomyography that measures how much strength, how much pressure are we putting in our muscle. Okay, because sometimes when we use EMGs, we think, okay, well, I'm going to detect all my strength on my muscles. No, it only detects action potential. Okay, it's spike, it ends the spike, you don't have no more information. Okay, so those. Um, those, these, these waves that you see here is those spikes of energy that reflects that the specific muscle where we are measuring, okay, had some kind of uh, energy spike. So DMG is interesting, but it's also very specific, okay. Um, so it records that it records the electrical signals that are produced by muscle fibers when they contract. Um, here we can have, um, sorry, mm -hmm. ah, okay, ECG. So the ECG is the same thing. Whenever our heart beats, we have a, a spike uh, of energy. And here we can catch that spike. So when mainly what an ECG does, it's, a, okay, there are some different places where you can measure your heartbeat. For example, here in the, here, here in the, the wrists, and I found yesterday uh, here in the middle. Okay, if you put your finger here, you can feel it. And for this, it's very interesting because in technique they are researching that, that using only one sensor to catch that because nowadays we need two and the third that is the ground. So it's a kind of bulky to, 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 to test that. But now they are researching on only trying to do with that with one. And they found that the, one of the good places to catch an ECG is here. So it's one of the things that we can test, for example, to, to see how we, because that's very interesting, at least for me. Um, so this is the ECG, yeah, okay. Now we have uh, the EDA, the EDA, the electrodermography, it's a technique that measures electrical activity of skin, specifically the electrical conductance of the skin. Uh, it allows basically to access the function of sweat glands and other skin parts uh, and how the skin conductance changes. And this is very interesting with this type of sensor according to emotional or physiological states. This is um, probably one of the most used sensors when we are trying to infer if the person is uh, with a high arousal, for example, or a low arousal if there is a higher level of excitement or a lower level of excitement, okay? The EVA, okay, that's what we use in the, the, the light detector test, okay? It's normally this because when you start to, to lie, you start to sweat and you start to sweat and the, the sensor grabs that, okay? Because that's one of the things that's also very interesting and we are going to talk a little bit about that uh, further on but it's the the way we can control this type the type of signal that we are using for example if i want to move an arm i can explicitly move it okay and i can explicit if i don't have any kind of of uh, problem i can move that uh, that arm but i cannot control completely if i'm sweating or not if i'm uh, okay so it it's very interesting because we can deal with the explicit control and implicit control, okay? We can have an explicit control of a movement and we can have an implicit control that is a kind of response that this, this sensor has, that it's more independent of our will, okay? But, uh, and it also has a, a, a development time that is very different. It rises, but then it's, it rises normally very um, rapidly, 
but then you have a lot of time so you can go back to your baseline, let's say like that, okay? So it's a type of sensor that's also interesting to look at this type of response of sensor and imagine also what kind of interactions they could, could foster. If, for example, if I want to, to light the, 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 the switch the lights of Chris ambient with some biosensors, probably it will be better with EMGs, more fast response than an EVA that it's more uh, soft and it has a little response time that is more uh, long, longer, sorry. Uh, another sensor is the, uh, the RESP sensor that measures the um, contraction, uh, contraction and the relaxation of the diaphragm during respiration cycle. So basically, this is a sensor that deals with our respiration. Okay, it grabs our respiration rate uh, and uh, normally uses a, a sensor that is attached here at the, at the end of here at the thorax, yeah? And um, as it's a sensor that detect, detects the, this kind of displacement, so if you breathe, if you inhale, or if you exhale, you have some kind of waves that uh, we can see that show us the, um, the respiratory cycle that we are having there. Um, then we have uh, probably the first one that was used and probably the most when we think about biosignals probably is this one that is the ones that we put on our head and they start to read our thoughts no it's a lie we cannot read that still but uh, we are in a way uh, probably uh, but the EEGs measure the electrolytivity of the brain uh, we put some electrodes on the scalp, okay, okay, here in the in the head, and we can measure some electrical activity on the upper layer of the brain. So it's very, very um, tiny what we can catch on that. So it's a very surface uh, information. We have already a lot of information running there. Uh, and then here, probably the other sensors, the electrodes are important because you need them to, to, to create a connection with the part of the body that you are measuring. But with EEGs, uh, the type of, of electrodes that you are using are very important, okay? Because there are dry electrodes, uh, wet electrodes, and uh, even this type of setup that it's a more, um, probably we have seen already those caps with a lot of uh, sensors, normally 36, for example, 36 is the number they use to map all the brain, okay? And there you can have much more information, always in the upper layer of the brain, but you can grab a lot of information from eye movements, from uh, levels of attention, focusing, uh, because that reflects on types of frequencies that are alpha waves, that are theta waves, they are related with uh, several states of mind. Okay, and uh, this is a very interesting uh, signal to work on because it's the first one that we think, okay, I have something in my head, how can I put it out there? So this uh, sensor is interesting, but at the same time, they are very difficult to work on because firstly, they are very bulky, they are very complicated to set up. Okay. For example, those caps, I can tell you why we, we took almost like 45 minutes only just to, to put the cap and to put everything working. <clears throat> These types of sensors that we have here on, the, on, the, on our image is what we have there. It's the simplified version of Bitolino that made with two sensors. Okay. That's not to say that uh, Hugo could <laughs> resume 36 sensors into, into sensors, no. But uh, these ones is a very, because it's a specific, Vitalin is not, for brain, there are uh, a different platforms. OpenBCI, for example, is a very well-known platform that uh, focus mainly on EGs. They don't develop anything else in, unless EGs like pupil, pupil uh, the, the, yeah, they use only for that, okay? And uh, OpenBCI only works with EEGs. Betalin is a more crossover thing, so they give you, uh, and we have there some possibilities to, to work with that, but it's very specific, very specific, okay? 
but uh, it's um, one interesting signal and mainly because it was and we'll see when we, we talk about the some applications in music was what, the first one to be used uh, to in the musical interaction uh, finally accelerometers okay we can con we can relate this to body signals or to bio signals uh, because okay this deals with movement but sometimes it's interesting if you have for example an acceleration of respiration to notice if there was an acceleration of the body or if it was an acceleration in a still position okay so we use acceler accelerometers just to complement the information that we are having with biosignals. So, but we can use that. Uh, these boards, I don't think they have accelerometers embedded, but uh, they have a sensor there. Okay. So, just to i talk a little bit about that but now i'm going to talk more specifically is the according to the type of signals that we have from these biosignals uh, what kind of classification can we have on those same biosignals when we are designing interactive systems because uh, one of the things that is very important is the perceived controllability that we have over that uh, same biosignal as I was tell, uh, telling, telling you uh, earlier, uh, when I want to move a muscle, I move a muscle is explicit. So we can say that, okay, we have a voluntary uh, controllability because individual controls the source directly in order to produce a specific outcome. Um, also, there is uh, indirect that individual influence but does not fully control the source directly like for example respiration okay we can control the respiration but we cannot stop breathing for a loss uh, at least we have few are not uh, divers professional divers that can stop breathing but even even then they have to start breathe again okay so we have a kind of indirect okay you can control it a little bit but you don't have total control on that Okay, almost like the same with the heartbeat. Okay, if I want to speed up my heartbeat, okay, I can. Uh, we made some experiments with the uh, actors, and uh, they want to feel the the, the tiredness, uh, and uh, okay, they run a little bit, and uh, the heart starts to 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 speed up. So you have some type of control on that, but it's indirect because you cannot control it uh, so voluntary like a muscle, for example. And then we have the involuntary, like. Uh, the digestion, for example, digest, okay, you eat, you cannot control your process, okay, he has the time that he has, and you cannot control those type of process. So this is interesting to look when we are talking about biosignals, because uh, according to the interaction that we are designing, we can uh, uh, choose a specific signal to work on, okay. Then we have uh, obtrusiveness. Uh, it's... The, 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 if the, the device that we are using is invasive, for example, uh, where the data collection is very, very close to the source and is normally placed inside the body, like, for example, a pacemaker or a smart pill, um, we don't work with these, of course, because this is a medical procedure, procedures and we are only working with uh, non-invasive, of course, non-invasive uh, devices, but... Uh, to have a very, very, um, or a, a better clear view of what is happening. Normally the invasive methods are more accurate, but not, uh, but I never use it. So I don't know. I know they, they exist. And then we have wearable, like uh, sensors that are in, in direct contact with the body that are sufficient to collect data. For example, Betalino, for example, smartwatches that uh, have some sensors uh, embedded in the in the system and in contact with your body, okay, it gives you some information. We cannot have that deep level of information when you have, for example, invasive techniques, but you have sufficient information. And then we have off the person uh, sensing, like uh, the signal source is assessed with contactless or object integrated sensors. For example, if you use a thermographic camera, 
que é tu catch the temperature during COVID, okay? we know about that. Uh, so it's a kind of detection of, for, of person. That is uh, sometimes also interesting to know. And uh, if, for example, you, we are working with uh, dancers that move a lot in the stage, uh, probably things like computer vision or this kind of thermography could be uh, more interesting to have different body temperatures that are running there. Okay. Um, but in our work, we are focusing mainly on the wearable uh, category. Okay, we are working with wearable because we are working with these kind of platforms, Bitalino, that are small, okay, not wearable completely, but are doable to the, we can work with that in a more in less intrusive way. Um, then we have uh, information observability that basically tells you uh, what type, uh, when can you have that information? Like, for example, if it's pervasive, you can take measurements in a regular everyday scenario, minimal constraint, for example, you want to catch GPS activity, okay? You just connect your GPS and you start to grab that. For example, if you are um, measuring the, you want to measure the, the action potential of this muscle, you put uh, an EMG here, okay, and you measure. But if you want to, to measure the blood pressure, for example, you have another type of, uh, if you go for the medical approach, okay, you have to that uh, device that you put on your arm. It feels pumps the the the, the thing, and then it starts to 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 match. So it has it has momentary. You cannot grab that signal constantly. Okay, you can grab it, and it tells you. Okay, you have uh, high high tension. This low tension. This and uh, that's what we have. And then we have controlled uh, environments where measurements can only be taken specific environments. Like for example x-rays uh, or uh, cat scans but for example motion capture uh, with cameras not with uh, sensors embedded in vests but in cameras you also have to go to that place specific place to to record that okay so here also in bicycles we have these um, then we have the signal properties the signal part properties tells you or tells us if the signals are persistent, that is, if the source maintains the same pattern over time, regardless overall conditions. Okay, I can move a muscle here. Uh, tomorrow I can move the same muscle or even, for example, the fingerprint. It's the kind of thing that doesn't change and is persistent. Okay. Uh, repeatable. Uh, it's the source, uh, the source reproduce a given pattern when certain conditions are gathered, like when we are working with evoked, pot evoked potentials. That is when we evoke some external stimuli to the, to the person, then we measure that. Okay. Uh, so it's a kind of thing that you can put, for example, um, a specific image and you can grab the reaction of the person to that image. And then we have uncertain, that is a type of source that has random patterns or that are difficult or impossible to model or reproduce, for example, an intentional muscle activations or an uncontrolled breathing rate. For example, if you arrive to a state of anxiety, for example, start to breathe very uncontrolled way, uh, or uh, if you have an intentional muscle activations, for example, when we are measuring uh, EMGs, uh, the, the muscle movements, if I put a sensor here, it's, it, it can also grab from different muscles. So this is not intentional, but it also is, is a kind of uncertainty that we have. Uh, that's one of the things. Biosignals are all uncertain, very uncertain. Uh, but uh, there are some that uh, can be more uncertain than others. Here we can have some kind of uh, uh, better um, approach to when we look to a specific bio, bio signal. This is interesting for uh, when designing interactions because it can gives you or gives us a, a bridge between the biotechnological part and the creativity and the interaction part that we want to, to do deal. Uh, so here we have uh, the example for the electromyography that can, can be considered to have a high type of control, high observ observability and medium stability. Okay, it's a high control because 
the person controls that type of movement. It has a high observability because we can see that happen. And it's a medium stability because the movement can change. Okay, As we have a lot of control, we have also the side effect of that, that we can have uh, very different and very not so stable uh, signal. For example, with ECG, as a low control, we cannot control so much to, to our heartbeat, but it can be very high observability when we measure it. We can see the spikes that correspond to the heart rate, and it's also a medium stability. For example, uh, when we are talking about EDA or for emotional arousal, for example, uh, EDA has a low control. Uh, we cannot, the, the person cannot control that type of signal because it's connected to the sympathetic nervous system. So we connect, cannot have so much control on that. We can observe that because we measure and we start to see the graph moving and it has a low stability because, okay, it doesn't stay or it doesn't even have a rhythm, okay? It's like a thing that goes up and down, okay? It's more like a line and line evolution. So these are basically three examples when we can uh, look at the biosignals in a technical and a perspective and then try to make the bridge for the, the interaction design. And there, uh, we, uh, that's where we have an empirical classification. Okay, we have a technical classification of the biosignals. Now we can look at them like the empirical classifications. What type of output I can have from the, this, when I connect a biosignal to a musical system? So this is a more uh, sound thing. Then we can discuss a little bit if you want to model to develop some musical interactions is the type of sound that's going to be uh, generated. If it's a sonification, that it's basically the first experiments that were made with biosignals, is like connecting a signal to an actuator when uh, you, you make this and the actuator responds to that. So it's a very explicit uh, connection. Uh, we can have uh, data collecting for analyzing biosignals from performance and for understanding a specific musical task. We can have kinetic output like mapping to vibratile, uh, vibrotactile surface, for example, or even to sculptures, uh, audiovisual, of course. The type of response of a system uh, when uh, an interactive musical system can have be generate, generative, narrative, the, when the system evolution is independent of the external input and we can use like only the input to conduct what is happening in sound, uh, sound related. We can have transformative uh, type of algorithms that uh, you can use to transform a sound and uh, sequence, and we can sequence sounds like, for example, you can have your heartbeat and according to which heartbeat you can catch a new note of a musical scale, for example. And then with your heartbeat, you make a traveling musical scale, for example, okay? Uh, so we can have, uh, start to 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 think on this kind of interactions also th when thinking about characteristics of the signals, and of course also the the affordance that we have from the same system. If we are going to design or prototype a system that is going to be used by one person only, okay, if it's going to be shared with an audience, if it's going to have a computational agent that interacts with the main system, or if it's a kind of mix match. Uh, about these uh, these uh, modes. So basically this is a um, uh, survey about the, the type and the characteristics of the biosignals and how we can start thinking on these signals to design interact musical interactions. Now, the second part uh, of uh, my presentation, it's not this, it's here, it's uh, to give you a survey on the use of biosignals in specifics in music. So basically, the, I like uh, very much this uh, poet Rainer Maria Rilke when he said that, uh, okay, those uh, coronal, those sutures that we have on the skull, if we put a needle of a graphenol passing there, we probably can hear sounds, okay? 
And this is very interesting because it's almost like uh, one of the things that uh, artists start to think it's how I can do music without touching anything, by thinking, only by thinking. Even today we think about that, okay, I think on the music and it appears. So this is uh, curiosity, of course. And uh, uh, Rainer Maria Rilke in 1999 uh, was uh, thinking on this and we, what would happen, a sound necessary results. Okay, probably, we don't know. But uh, this is the first uh, thought on uh, using or uh, creating music only by the power of thinking. Uh, one of the things that we use, uh, that one of the def definitions that we are working a lot is the term, it's the appropriation, okay? So this is a kind of a jump to a more philosophical thing that it's uh, what is appropriation, because here we are talking about uh, medical devices, okay? We are basically taking one thing, one technology of one context and put it working in a completely different context. So this deals with the term that uh, appropriation. According to, to Felix Watari, the propensity of art, uh, in art to renew its materials of expression, it brings, if not a direct contamination of other domains, then at least a highlighting and re-evaluation of the creative dimension that treasures all of them. This is interesting because it's the um, when we port one technology to the other, it's just not to change the context. Also, we are uh, going to contaminate that same technology with our uh, thinking, uh, for example, in this kind of... Oh, uh, now, I, when I look to biosignals, I only, I only hear sound. I cannot uh, think about diseases. I cannot think about, for example, I was with my colleagues in technical yesterday, I was working in biomedical engineering. So they are presenting me the, the projects and they are all about diseases. But for me, I, I don't look at biosignals on that way. But because it's the when you take one technology and you put it in another uh, area of research, and then uh, you kind of appropriate that technique and you say, okay, it's no more yours, it's mine now. So uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, More co uh, concretely, uh, Teoma Nakarat, uh, uh, she was a choreographer and she made a lot of work with dance and biosensors related to expressions of grief, pain. It's very, very interesting work. Uh, she talks about this term of appropriation. When a piece of technology uh, moves from one discipline to another, it carries with it traces of context, ethics, and aesthetics of its original intended use, which in turn shape the context of its use in foreign environment. In this new context, users are free to interact with it in ways that may violate the ethics of its use in its native discipline. For example, one example is uh, when I, I was uh, starting the PhD, I, I, I had a um, small time in the brain lab, that it's a lab that we have in Porto, in Inesh Tech, where they work uh, biomedical engineering. And one of the things that we were working with EEGs mainly, and one of the things that they were const constantly trying to avoid is the signals of the eye blinking. When you blink your eyes, if you, those, you have two sensors here that catch that occipital part of the brain that it connects to your eyes. And they are always trying to get, to get that. And I always find very funny the blinky, the blinking thing, because it, I, it's what we, I was saying. I look at biosynthesis and start to think on sound. What is the possibility that I can have if I work with the eye blink of a person, okay? Uh, so this is a little bit that example. It's when you, you port one technology to another, you can then use it freely almost, okay? And even sometimes that can may violate ethics and it's uh, of its use. So in this, um, this uh, part of the appropriation of uh, biosignals interactive musical systems, here we have just, uh, it's part of a study that we, we made uh, where we had to, to look on history and how these uh, sensors have been used in music. 
and uh, we start to look at the from 1965 to, to 2019 and we made a survey a comprehensive survey of all works uh, to the best of our knowledge that uh, apply the biosensors and uh, in music and to look what was the trend of use, how, what was the, the quantity of use, what is the quality of use, which sensors use, in what in kind of uh, affordance they want. So we look at this in very perspective. So I'm not going to bother you with details, but mainly it's just we found that there were three phases that we found during these uh, like uh, 50 years, okay? The first phase that spans from 65 to 85, it's the first uh, wave of using this type of sensors in music, okay? Uh, then from 85 to 2005, there were two two periods on that same period. One that uh, there was a less use, but continue use, and then there was a real, in the 80s, there was um, a slowdown of that use. And then suddenly we see a peak in the 2000s where uh, suddenly there was uh, a great use on the biosensors and the uh, interactive musical systems. Um, for now, we can, I just going to pass some examples. Probably it's good to see things being applied. And uh, this, so the second part will be just showing you some examples. We can talk, I will talk a little bit about these, uh, these works and uh, what they use. And uh, yeah, it gives us also some, some ideas to our own uh, prototypes. So on the, on the left, we have, um, a seminal work that is from Alvin Lucier, Music for a Solo Performer in 1965, where he invited everybody to a concert hall, everybody sit, and suddenly it was only one person sitting on a chair quietly and uh, not playing any instrument, okay? So this caused some kind of stir in the, in the musical community, what is this? And then suddenly they start to hear sounds even without the guy moving, okay? So this is music for a solo performer is considered the first musical piece that was uh, thought with the bio signals in, uh, in contact, in use. I can just uh, pass a little bit of that uh, recording if I can catch my, ah, it's here. <laughs> so here we have, uh, sorry, because this is from uh, VH VHS, okay. <clears throat> But uh, it's, it's interesting because it gives us also the idea of appropriation here. So the concert starts. And then there is someone that's going to start to put the sensors, like in a clinical setup. Suddenly you start to think that you are in a clinical setup, okay? And the, with all the procedures, the gel that you have to put, everything, even you will see that it will, I'm going just to, to make some jumps, okay? It's a clinical procedure here. And there is uh, an appropriation of that clinical procedure to the musical stage. What you, or this kind to the preparation of musical. Here is connected with some motors that were then connected some percussion instruments. Okay, so his brain waves start to move those motors. Those motors start to actuate on this percussion, on those percussion instruments. But as you don't have total control on, okay, you're going to start the concert. The concert doesn't start suddenly, okay? So it starts slowly. You use here the uh, alpha waves that are waves that are related to focus and concentration. Okay, when you start to close uh, your eyes and start to focus on one thing, these waves, these frequencies start to appear, start to appear. Sorry, and this is the the type of wave that uh, Alvin Lucia was after. Okay, so he had to work also to go to find that wave. 
one of the things that you use is if you close your eyes, it's normally good to to close and to help that state. And we start to hear at the middle of the concert is when we start to hear something. Those are the instruments, orchestral instruments. Even this is a kind of statement to the music, okay? I use timbles that normally I use five musicians of orchestras, and I'm controlling that with my thought. So, these are the actuators. Okay, you have those motors that are kicking the, the drums. And what it does there is control a kind of, let's say, an amplifier volume, okay? The intensity that you want to send or less intensity. But even that has influence on what the, what is sending also. So, okay, just gives us a little uh, idea of uh, these first experiments. Um, just get back here. Uh, and this is very interesting because it was on a musical stage. Uh, in the, the middle, it's um, a, uh, an analog instrument to be played with brain waves too. <clears throat> DG uh, was uh, amplified and processed, use uh, frequency. Um, basically, the the Erki Erki Korenieni, sorry for <laughs> the name, uh, developed this uh, thinking that uh, if we put some uh, musicians uh, working together and then they go to sleep, he believed that at some time the, their uh, thoughts would synchronize. So you want to measure this and you want to to use this to. But it was interesting because it was the first device, device that it's not a clinical device like Alvin Lucier used a clinical device. Erki developed his own uh, hardware and to 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 care to to work on this. Uh, Dave Rosenboom, uh, it's also a very very interesting uh, or very important figure in the brainwave music because it's the first recording of uh, musical pieces composed uh, with musicians and brainwaves. And he assumed the brainwaves. Brainwaves were connected to a big analog uh, systems, synthesizer systems, where the musicians were playing, but also they were feeding the system that uh, made an accompany on that. So, in, and even today is, uh, a very uh, uh, power user of uh, brainwave. The universe boom is very interesting. Uh, just to pass a little bit here back, this is a, um, a diagram of the implementation of music for solo performance from Olivier Moussier, the first one that we saw. Uh, you can see almost if you look at this, you can imagine that this is a setup for an, a plot for an orchestra, but it's not. It's only for one person sitting on a chair in the middle, and the, everything else is actuators that come from the the, the his measurements. So here we can say that these first practices that span from sixty five to eighty five are appropriation of medical devices that that underwent several stages of hacking to adapt to uh, specific musical settings. Uh, it consists basically on, di on direct translations of brain's electrical activity into host signals that are mapped to physical actuators and or electronic, electronic musical instruments. That is, there is no mediation on this signal. The signal get out and get in, get out of your brain, get in into the actuator. And um, there is a kind of immaterial connection between the control and feedback. Because uh, Alvin Lucier was sitting quietly, he was not moving. You cannot connect what you are seeing what, 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 with what you are hearing. So this uh, first practice approach, the biosignal embodied musical interactions in this uh, type, with this kind of uh, approach. Uh, then uh, 
from 85 to 2005, we, we found a second wave of using biosignals um, where uh, computational power, inter interoperability for in between computer and human, increased transparency and hardware miniaturization promoted new approaches to the practice uh, with the interactive musical systems and biosignals and with more uh, sophisticated uh, mapping technologies. Uh, on, the, on the left, we have uh, Sensor Band. Sensor Band is a band that is composed by Van der Heide, Zbigniew, Karkowski, and Atal Tanaka. Atal Tanaka is a very prolific researcher in the area of muscle and biophysical music. Okay, uh, He works with a lot with muscles muscle and skeleton positions to 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 create sound we can just look open link please and probably this is a little bit So this is more recent, it's not from that time, but uh, can give us a little, a different approach from what we see on the... Here is using a my electro myogram, a myo. It was a sensor. It was a sensor that uh, was developed like uh, ten years, eight years ago. Now it disappeared completely. By the way, if you want to have one, a Totanak is for sure. <laughs> but every every myograms that he found on the internet because he posted a photo of a box full of them and with a tidy caption, I bought them all. <laughs> You have one here? Be careful. Don't say that to him because he wants to buy that from you. Because they finished. My, 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 it disappeared completely. But it was a very interesting because this is a bracelet that has eight sensors. And this is a very an EMG super on steroids because it can give you a lot of information. Like if you are pointing one finger, if you have your hand open, closed, if you are pointing to one. That's why you use this kind of patterns, okay? This is patterns that he teach the, he taught the system to learn these patterns, okay? Uh, and then to pick some sounds according to those same patterns that uh, he is, he's using. So um, it's a more, um, it's a more uh, sophisticated than to, than to have uh, the, that immaterial connection with the uh, Alphine Lucier sitting here, we have, um, a part of performance also, okay? You are performing with your body. Sorry. One of the things that uh, is, is at Altanac states is that, okay, if you want to work with this, you have to re relearn your body almost like. You have to relearn a lot of things. Like you, when you are picking up a new instrument, start to play a new instrument, you have to, <laughs> you are going to eat in a wall a lot of times. So when we are using also your body as a musical instrument, you have also to relearn how to use your own body. And uh, this is one of the things that it's very interesting in the, in the work of um, Atal Tanaka. So we made this band, sensor band, that's not here. Why? Because my, okay. Uh, the sensor band was very famous uh, using these uh, biosensors. For on that time, it was all wire, not wireless. It was wired, okay? Because here we can see that it's connected to the to the system, okay? Um, and on that video that we saw, it was all Mayo is a completely wireless system. Uh, but also we had some different approaches to biosignals by introducing biosignals in the um, installation. Like, for example, these are installations from Dunning and Woodrow that develop a series of working works where they explore biosensors in a more intimate context, such as multimedia art installations, where participants, for example, on the left, it is a live cast uh, dummy, okay? 
and the participants were invited to touch, stroke, and to breathe on particular sizes of that uh, of that body, and then it creates sounds and visuals according to. Um, on this uh, experiment, uh, it's body degree zero. Two participants discuss uh, the worst scars that they have on their skin, and they, they talk about that uh, front in front in a table. The table is filled with motion and proximity sensors, and participants are wired to biosensors, such as EEGs. And uh, the idea is that as they share and they tell their stories, there is a 3D visualization uh, about that emotional state and the physiological state of those participants when discussing some uh, war themes that they pass uh, on. Um, in 2000, we have um, an important uh, topic that arose and that Rosalind Picard uh, coined the term affective computing. Probably you already heard this. Uh, this comes from the, her book from 2000, Effective Computing, where she states in the introduction that computers are beginning to acquire the ability to express and recognize affect and may soon be given the ability to have emotions. Models are suggested for computer recognition of human emotion and new applications are presented for computer-assisted learning, perceptual information retrieval, arts and entertainment, and human health and interaction. Effective computing coupled with new wearable computers will also provide the ability to gather new data necessary for advances in emotion and cognition theory. So basically, she's uh, postulating the, the effective characteristics that a computer can have, not, not only in recognizing emotions, but only expressing emotions through content. Okay, So this is very interesting because it brought the idea to the to the discussion, this idea of effective uh, computing. This is one of the prototypes that uh, Rosalind Picard developed, that is the um, conductor's jacket, that is a jacket filled with sensors that were um, uh, that conductors use during the, um, the musical performance. And so they record, recorded all that data and they want to, to, to to link how expressive uh, movement is and how connected is that to the, also to the expressive of the to the expression of music. Um, so it's a specific uh, jacket that is equipped with physiological and motion sensors to catch that uh, information. So this. Practices that um, we made some brief examples, but uh, during this uh, second wave, uh, there were in the beginning few musical works appropriated by sensors as control structures in inter interactive musical systems, probably because of the the signals that to start to use, which was brain signals. But brain is very complex, and also at the time the analytical tools were very very limited. You are almost uh, uh, limited to work with the raw signal and you cannot do any pre-processing on that because you don't have like we have now uh, for example computation power and machine learning artificial intelligence to look at this information and try to give you more accurate responses to what uh, we are inputting although in the 2000s, we have uh, an emerge uh, bio signal driven interactive musical systems emerged with higher levels of reasoning, uh, fostering uh, new age where techniques such as artificial intelligence and machine learning were became pervasive. So this brings you to the third and last wave of the appropriation of biosensors in interactive musical systems. Atal Tanaka continues to research in embodied interaction, continues to buy all the miles he can, but uh, it's, he, he continued to develop a work very, very, very interesting. And he has, uh, I can then share with you, he has a very good talk about how to build biophysical music. So for the ones that could be interesting, it's uh, very interesting. And even the work of Atotanaka is completely, uh, it's uh, very important. Um, Sorry, just academic thing. If someone wants to to have 
some kind of knowledge about the, the works that Totanaka developed. And then uh, we have uh, here two examples. Ah, okay, this is uh, 2008, okay, Miguel Ortiz uh, created the piece for uh, amplified uh, cello and EMG sensors. Um, and also he composed on the, the other, on the, on the right, composed SNV, a work for amplified saxophone, violin, and ECG uh, uh, signal, so art rate. So basically, what uh, he did, he reused pre recorded data sets of ECGs uh, that were uh, recording during rehearsals, okay, and then used that uh, information to generate new material during the performance, as uh, specifically in melodic and rhythmic patterns uh, when he interacts with the cello. So he plays cello and then he can have some kind of a company that uh, interacts with that. Indeed, that comes from these pre-recorded data sets that uh, Miguel made from ECGs. Uh, also, we worked with, uh, I put here because these are all colleagues of ours in the PhD in digital media, uh, and they develop a pro collaborative project in 2015 with the Sonic Minds. Uh, where they propose a real-time sonification for, of the brain phenomena through uh, neuro. And also, because this was made also with the Faculty of Psychology and Neurophysiology department, so also they were working on this uh, project. Um, this project it was, is Multimodal Brain Orchestra, as a project that explored the creative poten potential of a collection of musical brains, okay? Not only one brain, but a collection of musical brains. So the orchestra members played virtual musical instruments using EEGs, the electroencephalography. Emo also, these here, as we have now um, the ability to make signal processing, they start to infer some kind of emotional state also. And we start to talk about emotions here. I think here we can see, uh, because I know there are some people here from Barcelona. Yeah, they are from Barcelona, so I'm going to, to pass. And this is interesting because it's the, uh, hello, Ian, ah, push. sorry. I don't think my password will appear. <laughs> So it's a small three minutes video. I propose we see the video because it's interesting. They are talking about the process of creating these. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, maybe I could put some. Uh, no. Thank you. No. Ah, it's the Vimeo. Vimeo. Sorry. Uh, should I keep on or no? No. Ah, because it's so heavy. I don't have. Uh... <laughs> no, but it's interesting. <laughs> so I didn't remember that because as a Portuguese, okay, no problem with it. La multimodal de orquestra, de, al nom de la, de, 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 la multimodal, porque tenim varias entradas que, uh, que intueixen a la composición. Este es un cap que se utiliza con estas 36 sensores. Ay, sorry, es un cap que usamos con 36 sensores. Portugués switch. La suor de la pell, y después también brain, pero la parte de brain, que también utilizamos mecanismos de lectura de dades del cervell, de la IG, de la computadora de interfaces que juegan. As you see, it's very complex to work with this. Uh... Al directa, que es va fer amb una conferència científica a Praga, que hi ha aquí tot. Four brainwaves, and that is the art beat. Disposat de la següent manera. Hi havia els quatre músics amb el Brain Computer Interfaces en una part de l'escenari, asseguts amb cadires, perquè has d'estar calmat per dar atenció al sistema. 
Després hi havia un altre músic que estava connectat al batec del cor i a la suor de la pell, que incluïa amb els visuals. El director d'escena en el mig, dirigint només els músics que estaven connectats amb el Dents de Dents de Pell i les dues pantalles traduint la pell. Hay una primera fase que es una fase de entrenamiento de estudiantes, las personas que están utilizando eh, estas interfaces de entrenamiento tal como voy ahora o una hora, dependiendo de los casos. Y solo lo que tienen que hacer en el caso de Keep eh, Presented es eh, pensar, concentrarse en una lista que está eh, en la pantalla y nada más. Por ejemplo, había una partitura escrita por un compositor que se llama Jean-Claude Mansuri, con quien colaboramos. En un cierto momento de la, del, del, del concierto, uh, el, el jefe de orquesta dice, bueno, vamos a reducir esta parte A, por ejemplo, en la parte de O, Brain and Vision, uh, piensa en la letra A, y esto uh, hace que el evento A se puede... Esto solo porque... Porque hay aquí cosas que son interesantes, que es cuando... Ah, sorry. Switch to English. There are some very interesting things here because, uh, and this is uh, one of the things that I uh, I didn't know, didn't knew that, but when I saw, I was kind of struck with that. Is for example, when you think on letters, you have specific parts of your brain that shoot. Okay, when you are thinking on moving your hand and you move, you there are specific parts of the brain that shoot. But if you are thinking on moving your hand and you don't move your hand, there is a different part of the brain that shoots. Okay, that's why he's saying, okay, when we want to change to a specific part of the composition, we should think on letter A, or we should think on something that they trained and they, th they saw that uh, it was the um, kind of ground base for everybody. So they have to start to think, and then you have to evoke that. That's why they have those displays with the, the images coming. So to evoke that, because here it's also very difficult to, there is a difference between evoking and eliciting, okay? In evoking, you have an external stimuli. In, in eliciting, it's from you. So here, that's why they have also these displays is that they could have some kind of evo evoke potential so they can have some kind of more um, uh, provision of what's going to happen, okay? Because take it with a grain of salt, of course, uh, because these signals are very uh, different very unstable. Uh, però, al mateix temps, a mesura que vagin millorant... And this is normally these movements of lights that your brain control, is going to flicker different parts of the brain. I també va en conjunció d'un coneixement del cervell, amb el qual és una tecnologia que diguem que no pararà d'investigar. Well, this is a, an example of this uh, multimodal brain orchestra. I think they stopped this uh, project, but uh, until very recently, they were still working on this. So, and they make some very interesting projects. So just to move on, uh, more recently, this is a work of Marco Donnarumma, uh, this is um, a performance that he made, Corpus Nil. Uh, it's a performance by man, a performance by man in artificial intelligence that it was presented on Ars Electronic in 2017, and it received an uh, honorary prize award for this piece. And I saw this live; it's amazing. And here, uh, Marco uses these sensors. Here are mechanical. And these are sensors that sense the pressure that you, the force that you are applying to the muscle, not the potential, but the force that you are applying. Because this has to do a lot with the work that he developed, that is a work with the, a fusion of, about the meat, meat and the technology and the machine. Okay, the, this is a kind of very cyborgist uh, thing. And uh, on this type of work, the, the, the mechano, not the electromyography, but mechanomyography. It's more used when you want to catch the, the strength and that you are putting on your muscles. 
So he, he, Marco Donnarumma deals with the hybrid identities reflected in concepts such as being either a human or a machine. Uh, man and machine take the stage together in a conventional se uh, sense, but what emerges is a an hybrid new creature that normally emerges from his works. Um, yeah. Um, this is a fabulous, uh, incredible uh, work that he presented uh, very recently. Like uh, I saw it in 2018, yeah. It's the Ali Azuntai. It's a stage for dancers and for uh, for the uh, actors and for machines to inhabit that. And the, all the, the, they use biosensors, very mechano. For example, here you can have a picture of the mechano that he used. It's normally this bracelet that he puts here in the muscle. Here he is measuring the PPG, pol, uh, pl, uh, um, blood pressure, basically awakened. You can, you can measure your heartbeat from also from these type of sensors that are measuring here the blood pressure that you have. It's a light that passes, and when you have a contraction, a dilation of the heart, you have difference on that pumping, and with that light, you change. You notice the, those changes. So, but then is mixed with a, with a hybrid uh, machinery here. I'm just going to show you. Uh, in here, it's it's interesting because sorry. Here is interesting because it starts, uh, and uh, that's a practice that we, we notice uh, on this third wave is the use of uh, more uh, computational resources. Okay, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence that can help and uh, can foster this type of uh, interactions that are not so raw like the, the first ones of Alvin Lucien, you can have the more uh, exquisite and more uh, hybrid and more uh, ambiguous thing working there. So just to see, uh, this is also very interesting because it speaks a little bit about the construction of the piece. And uh, yeah, I think it's, Alice Tai is a performance project that combines uh, dance theater and artificial intelligence and like, physical music. In Alice Tai, we explore um, how machines that are artificial intelligence affects human relationship at a psychological level, a physical level. This machine is reacting completely to the physiological state of the actors. The machine is reacting to that. Both cities. It has been a quite a exciting journey through the body's understanding of the potential and the danger of artificial intelligence. And also, the artificial intelligence generates the script in real time for the, the piece. Working as a choreographer and a, a performer for this project. And uh, the most uh, interesting question I got oftenly asked was, how does it feel to work with AI, the high tech, the robot, which has its own uh, sensation and uh, reactions? In order to understand what the robot 
do the act or will act. I actually have to first communicate with the artist. You would also come to me to get a deeper understanding what is my desire and uh, what is also my limitations and uh, the potentials. I'm also thinking about the why our daily life be designed in this way, our modern life in this way. What is the difference between the before the ancient life to now? Because for theater plays, the public never change. We use a different form, but we're still talking about war, peace, love, sex, well, um, conflict. This new topic brings me, I can dig more about what is human beings and what is the new life, the technic life, change us, or in fact, it changed nothing. We think it changed a lot, but the basically, the very fundamental things never change. So, um, because I normally became very fascinated again. Um, this is a good example of uh, contemporary use of biosignals in, uh, in, in interactive systems and the interactive musical systems uh, with a higher level of reasoning, higher level of abstraction, uh, in using all the resources now that we have in terms of hardware, in terms of software, in terms of philosophical side of all of the question. And uh, I think it's um, a good uh, work to finish this part of the presentation, this, this presentation with uh, the work that uh, probably we could think tomorrow if you want to develop these uh, questions that we have. If you want to have some direct mappings, if you want to have some kind of machine learning in the way to learn things and to, so it's uh, interesting. So the third part will be some application tomorrow during the workshop. If anyone is interested in looking at this type of biosignals, I have some software working to look at biosignals and try to prototype some simple into uh, musical interaction. So I leave the third part of the presentation for tomorrow. And uh, very thank you very much for your attention and thank you. <laughs>